Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire White and welcome to the 2021 mid-season member Q&A. Thank you so much for your patience uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have been overwhelmed with the amount of questions we've received since launching this Q&A and we hope this afternoon you get a bit, bit of insight and answers to those questions. Now, we can't get to all of them. We've had nearly 500 questions come in over the past couple of days. So we've sort of put them into themes, put them into groups and hopefully the, uh, the type of question that you've asked, if you've submitted one, will get covered this evening. There will be time to answer a few more at the end of the event, so feel free to pop those in the chat um, and we'll do our best to get to those at the end. Now, I'll introduce my panel this afternoon. We have Brett Ratton, Simon Lethleen and David Rath and these lovely gents will be taking the questions today and I think with, with all of that said, we might get underway. So I will pass over to question one is from John Mulkern, who's a 16 year member guys. And he asks, I'm concerned with the apparent lack of cohesion shown by the players on the field. We're not gelling the way we did last year. Does the coaching group think that the influx of imported players over the last two years has affected the team psyche? I can pick that one up if you like, Rats. Yep, yep. Um, good question, John. I think the connections where a lot of these discussions start, um, certainly last year, in Noosa, um, we managed to build on our connection and we put a lot of effort into that. Ben Robbins, our sports psych, identified early last year that uh, there were some gaps in our connection, so we prioritised that. Definitely it worked for us in Noosa and that sort of hub life was a unique experience and we tended to thrive last year um, through the connection of our new group. And any time that you change people in a group, you do obviously get a change in culture. Um, and so there was an opportunity to reset, which we've, we've done over the last two years. What I think we've identified now though is that there's a need to um, move from a connection basis to more of a high performance edge focus and there's no doubt that we've been challenged by that this year. It's something that we've identified, um, we're working really hard on it at the moment. Uh, we've had a sort of intensive period with the players in Sydney on trying to narrow down on that focus. Um, so yes, uh, connection is important. We don't feel as though we're not connected at all. In fact, the data that we've recently got is uh, supportive of us, of us being a really connected group. It's more about bridging the gap to being, you know, that that edge, getting that edge towards, you know, um, a high performance environment. So that's where we think we're at with that question. The players look to have lost the hunger and fight to win games and just switch up for large parts of games. How do individuals explain this at the end of the game and are they held to account? Do they have to explain themselves to the group? And that's from Johnny Rundle, 12 year member. Yeah, um, yeah, John, um, yeah, through the review process, we uh, we go through and highlight what it looks like when we're playing well or that act is um, what we're after and the expectations of it, whether it's a ground ball, whether it's a marking contest or a spoiling contest and what we're after, or it's transition running. Um, and then we highlight it with the difference of maybe the third quarter or the fourth quarter, which will be tomorrow. The players have got to review tomorrow and we will show the difference between really the first half of the game and the second half and the gap there and our consistency you know, with concentration or applying yourself is, you know, the, the gap that we're trying to bridge and a gap that will allow us to have a four quarter performance. And, you know, that, that gives us the four points. And that's been the gap this year where last year we could sustain that for longer and we are missing that this year. What's the panel's view of the players' effort on field this season? I don't mind if we lose the players, if they have, if, if, sorry, I'll start again. I don't mind if we lose, if the players have a genuine crack but in far too many games this season, the players have just given up. Is it a fitness issue or an effort thing from Ryan Smart, 31 year member? I'll probably pick up on the, on the fitness side of things to start with. Um, certainly our you know, data would suggest that we are a fit team. Um, GPS output in games of footy when you lose is actually usually higher than when you win. So we don't think that um, the data is suggestive or our, our eye, eye, um, what our eye tells us is suggestive of the team that's not fit. Um, perhaps there is some, some effort um, that we would question at times and we, we've looked at that um, and that's probably where we think it, it sits. It's more the absolute effort that we need to get out of players. Uh, we as a program take responsibility for, for that. We're working hard on actually driving those conversations and stands with our players at the moment to, to as Rat says, to bridge that gap between where our performance is at at the moment and where we need to get it to. But no, it's not a fitness um, concern. How can you expect players to be motivated or playing at their best when there doesn't seem to be an accountability for their performance or worry that they might get dropped? And this anonymous questioner has 
had Bradley Hill as an example. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that, um, Simon and David. Um, there is an accountability piece here and um, you know it's the art of coaching is about supporting a player when they have a lack of confidence um, and down on form and backing them in um, to a point where you've you know said that's enough and they go back and maybe play in the VFL and, and get some form and we've done that this year with you know Nick Caulfield and Bradley Hill and a few others were close to that conversation, but probably because of their availability with injury, some of those decisions were taken away from us with knowing that our performance was important to win the game um, and probably the availability of certain types of players that would, could come in and play their role. So, um, yeah, there, that's been a question around match committee and I think at one week we probably had some changes, but then on the Thursday we actually got a few more injuries and we actually had to change on the run and change our team back to with some of the players back in the team. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fine line, giving players confidence and support versus, you know, the lessons and the accepting uh, the standards and um, that's been a big conversation and probably would have had some changes if we had a healthy list. Next one from Andrew Parker, who's a nine-year member. How in elite sport can there be such a massive difference in performances week to week? 50 plus point losses are inexcusable. Yeah, well, that's that's the uh, that's the conversation that we've had. Even even in some of those bigger losses, there's been half a game that's been pretty good and showed some good form, and then fell away um, in some of those games. So, even when you watch the West Coast game, you know, the, you know, we, we were struggling a little bit to score in the first half of that game, and then our second half was outstanding with our pressure and that. And you know, we, we need to bring that each week and um, that's what we're trying to do is bridge the gap and show the players what's the difference between, um, you know, not just an effort but a, a huge effort and a sustained effort and that's what we need and that's the team that we want to become and um, that's what we're trying to do and as we spoke earlier about bridging the gap, that'll be important for us, you know, moving forward is making sure that we don't waver from these standards to win, lose or draw. It's a way we go about it and what we accept and, you know, we won't be accepting that and players will, hopefully we get players back and we can make changes if players don't adhere to that. It's probably a good opportunity to speak to some of the work we've been doing um, yeah. in bridging this gap. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've identified um, for some time now that there is um, a big uh, scope for improvement in uh, some of our effort uh, as, as one sort of indicator. We've done a lot of work um, over the past two weeks, particularly in our trip to Sydney, where we did an intensive um, period where we deliberately set about trying to address this with our players. Um, this is not something new. We've obviously understood this for a period of time. So we deliberately set about using that period of while we're away to get better in this space and to identify and, and get the players to understand and the players to actually work through what they thought some of these uh, concerns were. Um, we've come up with a theme around bridging the gap between where we're at now uh, and where a so-called dynasty program would be. And our players spent a period of time looking at that. We conducted a number of sessions and we've got a little bit of video here which shows you some of the flavour of that. We'll give you a little bit of an, an insight in some of the work that's going on in that space. A framework for our improvement, okay? Not just getting better to be the best. Yeah, right now it feels a bit flat. You know, we haven't had the, the first half of the year that we would have liked to. A uh, bloody shit run with injuries. We're in a little, little bit of a hole right now. And so you'd be thinking, why are we doing this now? Now's the right time to be doing this because now's the opportunity for us to start turning it around. So I just sort of spoke a little bit about um, just giving effort and what that looks like. And I feel like where we want where we want to get to now is bridging that gap, and we need to start showing um, clips and showing guys and, and us leaders as well what absolute effort looks like. There's there's certainly times you know, and I'll put my hand up where I think I'm giving effort, but I know I can give a lot more. So, um, and then I need guys around me, and we all need guys to be able to tell each other that that's not good enough. That's not the effort we want, and that's where we need to get to. And, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you've got to get comfortable being like that. Our program in general, obviously very uh, player driven, but we feel like there's room for the guys who've been at successful clubs, both players and staff, to have a bit more of an influence. You've got to look at what you're doing from a performance point of view and how you're going game day. Where am I, where am I lacking? What am I, what am I going to improve on? So I just find what Steely does, what Doug does, because 
you might not be at the level they're at, you might need to do some extra stuff. So being really clear of what you need to work on, not what everyone else is doing, what you need to work on. So um, if you don't know what that is, ask. If you look at our history as a footy club, the numbers paint a pretty stark picture in terms of where we've been. But the flip side of that is the opportunity. You can do something that no one's ever done before. Yeah, so you can see from that video, there were some pretty in-depth discussions that the players drove that gave really rich insight into where they thought we were at and what the scope was for, for improvement. And I guess that's the exciting part, that's the opportunity that, that we're looking at right now, is we're saying, yes, we're in a, in a, you know, a dark period right now, but the opportunity for growth is massive. Um, and the opportunity to do something really special is right there in front of us. Um, so we're framing it that way, we're looking at this gap, and that's our focus for the rest of the year is actually to get across that gap uh, as far as we can between where we are now and becoming what we're calling a dynasty team. So that's, that's that piece of work and it's significant for us. Yep. Next one from John Dagian, who's a 17 year member. Please explain the leadership development program. Um, well, I can, I can give you a brief outline, I suppose there we've got, um, I guess a few people across that program for us, you know, from the, the two guys here, Brett and David, um, also Ben Robbins, our Head of Mental Health and Wellbeing, and Jared Ruffhead. Um, and apart from the, you know, the regular meetings we have with our leadership group, which is a group of seven, um, you know, we have weekly case studies, um, weekly sessions on what leadership means to them and, and how they want to be known as leaders and how we can educate them to grow into those positions. Um, it's a pretty thorough program. Um, we're seeing some growth in some of our leaders this year. I think Steely's a, you know, a 13 year, oh, sorry, a 13 game captain and, and in good form and, and leading from the front. We've sorely missed a few of our leaders at times too, gears especially across the last couple of years. Um, and obviously some of our players not available in, in the last few weeks, but it's certainly an area on field where we need to improve and get better and see more leadership qualities come to the fore and, and more of our players jump on the back of our leaders as well. Um, and off field, we need them to set the example and grow. Um, and some of them are new. You know, Dougal Howard's been here for two years and is vice captain of the club. Kel Wilkie, likewise, is a young leader who's very impressive, very measured, very composed. Um, so there's a lot of growth there, but there's huge growth opportunities as well. Uh, we work hard on it, um, need to get better at it, and we need more of our non-defined you know, non -defined leaders to, to jump on board and, and grow with the club as well. Rats, I might throw this one to you. Yep. Um, this person has identified that we lack leadership within the playing group. Um, who do you think is the player or players who will step up to take us forward? Well, I think I think Simon just mentioned a few in um, Howard. Um, you know, his ability to speak up in in meetings and and really try and drive standards is at a really high high level. Um, Jack Sinclair is another one that's really improved this year and, and shown you know leadership quality. But you know then you've got the other other players that have been around for a little while. Seb Ross has been around there, but his ability to you know be selfless and play multiple roles for us, Timmy Memory. But just to watch some of the young kids start to develop in Ryan Burns, um, you know he, him instructing some of our older boys in, in, on game day is pretty pretty exciting to think. This, this young fellow's only, you know, a handful of games in, but he's trying to really help the group and really speak up and direct players on field to make sure that we're in the right position structurally. And, you know, he's a player of the future that I think could develop into a leadership role, but it's still early. And, you know, we've, we've still got the Clark, Caulfield and, and those types that are still learning their way in the game and their seasons have been up and down a little bit this year, but they have some leadership qualities as well that we've got to keep pushing for. I think it's also important just to to raise it, there's some players we've brought in from other clubs, you know, Dan Butler who's played in the Premiership, has been really important the last couple of weeks in his views about where we're at, where we can get to. Um, Zach Jones is a, you know, a, a leader by example and by effort and by um, his aggression and he's brought something to the table by his leadership too and um, some of the players we've brought in um, have really made a difference and we hope they can um, keep, you know, passing off the standards they're used to in this space and, and help us grow as well. Question from Ian Morrison, who's a 54-year member. Are our players fit enough? While other teams seem to have the ability to energetically sprint away to create chains of play, 
Our boys seem to trail slowly, leaving the opposition almost unopposed running into their forward half. Yeah, I think we, we touched on some of this question earlier in, in regard to the, the fitness question. There's a couple of things that I think which are also valid and worth worth noting that um, the point that I think it's Ian mentioned in that around players bursting from contests. Well, if you take away um, Gresham and Jones, um, they're two of our probably our biggest burst players. So we have a, a midfield which has um, you know pretty good ability to get their hands on the pill. Um, but at the moment, we're a little bit limited in our spread, and that's uh, largely out of our hands in terms of the numbers or the players we've got to select. There's a bit of a, you know, a player attribute um, thing there that, that's difficult that we're challenged with at the moment. Um, certainly, we have some players with elite endurance who have, you know, who have stepped up in that space, um, and we've been missing some of those as well. Like Jaron hasn't played a lot of footy this year. Um, ben Patton's another one who's got good speed and a good mix who hasn't played. So that's definitely part of it. Um, but yeah, look. We don't think it's a fitness concern. We think it's more of an attribute concern and um, and an effort concern. Yeah, I think Tim Membry touched on in that piece you just saw. Um, there's an acknowledgement that understanding what effort looks like and what effort above that threshold can be achieved is a pretty important, um, not piece of work, but it's an important understanding as you grow into being a professional in the AFL. Uh, there's a high threshold to get to and our players, I think, acknowledge that and we're going to work with them to, to see it more often. Yeah, I'd agree with that. With the, um, you know, pushing the limits in physically and mentally, I think um, you know we've got to keep going down this path of bridging the gap, and we can't just have a, a you know a solid effort. We've got to have the maximum effort, and um, that will be something consistent throughout the rest of this season and, and monitored. Next one from Brian Lynch, who's a 24-year member. Are our fundamental foot and hand skills up to scratch? Players have such little time in the modern game but we look so poor? Yeah, good question again, Brian. I reckon um, those two questions are somewhat related, that at times we do make the game look pretty difficult, um, and but other times we've made the game look pretty good. And if you take our Geelong game as an example, there were patches of that game where we were able to cut them to pieces with our ball movement. Um, but on the flip side, there were patches when we weren't and there were patches when they were able to dominate us. It is around um, you know, understanding and effort and when to apply that effort um, in creating space. That makes our skills so much easier. So those two things are, are really related and you can't, um, can't have one without the other. So you know, we had patches in pre-season particularly where you know, we were cutting teams up with our ball, ball movement and our skills. So it's there. We're not getting it out to the best of our capacity and there are a number of factors um, that underlie that that we're addressing. One from Chris Warne, who's a 37-year member. What are the plans to rectify our incredibly bad set shots at goal? This is something that's plagued our team for quite a few years and has resulted in too many games lost entirely on inaccuracy. You can have a fantastic game plan, but if you don't regularly put the ball through the goals, it's to no avail. Yeah, it's something that um, it has been frustrating um, throughout the season. I think, uh, you know, last year we were you know, second for accuracy and this year we're, we're 17th. So our ability to maybe take some pressure off in games, even when we're not going so well, um, in a quarter, we, we last year we scored and kept scoreboard pressure on the opposition. So um, you've got to identify what type of shot it is, set shot and the snap, snap goal kicking. Um, We've gone through the process with you know with David and Ruff that do a fair bit of work with our players and Ben Robbins in about the process um, and sticking to the process. I think over the last few weeks we've probably rushed a lot of our set shot goal kicking, especially when we're further out from goal, which we are having more shots this year than last year. So going through the process, using your 30 seconds and, and sticking to that. And then on the snapshots, are they you know on the run? Are they near the boundary? Are they acute? I think that's something from a craft point of view that that the players are still working a fair bit on. So we're doing a lot of, you know, it's putting a lot of time into our program with that, um, between drills, at the end of training, at the start of training, you know, in craft sessions during the week, but um, it's something that we'll try and rectify as quickly as possible. But sometimes it's up to the individual and uh, sticking to the process is the key point there. I think the other point that's probably relevant there is where we're getting our shots from. We're getting, we're getting shots from worse positions than we were last year. There's no doubt about that on the back of, um, you know, probably some poorer ball movement. So we are more defendable. Um, we're not getting the easy shots from the goal square, the so-called Joe the Gooses that make your conversion look so good. That has really hurt us. Um, opposition teams have probably worked hard on defending that aspect of our play, so we're not getting that as much. 
And to a certain extent, goal kicking woes can be contagious too, and the pressure can be passed on from one to the other. It's, mm. it's a little bit of team pressure builds as one player misses one, and then that next player that absorbs the pressure from that shot. So um, there is a mental component to it, and we've invested heavily in that space and we're working hard on it, and uh, we'll, we'll get it done. This next one's been spoken about a lot, so keen to get an answer, final uh, sort of word on it. What was the rationale behind not welcoming Matthew Lloyd to help Max King with goal kicking? If you feel we have the right talent to help our players, why has our set shot conversion regressed so horribly? Was it a salary cap decision? I can probably answer the first half, but I mean, it wasn't a salary cap decision. Um, there was never a discussion about um, the cost around any of that. Um, the conversation we had with Max as a club was, um, you know, keeping the messaging and the practice and the routine and his process um, within uh, the footy club and utilising the resources he has here, which is mainly Ruffy and, and, and Rathi, who's done this in previous, um, in previous football roles. Um, but, you know, to be clear, and there was a decision we made as a club with Max, uh, but to be clear, you know, there's there's been some suggestion that we blocked or stopped him from seeing Matthew. I think, I mean, those two are friends. They'll be lifelong friends. And if, if Max wants to reach out to Matthew and, and see Matthew, he, he'll do so at his own leisure. But um, there was some, some reason behind that. And I might let Rathi talk to some of the, the more specifics around it. But um, it was a pretty straightforward and a pretty, and a pretty relaxed conversation amongst the club and Max. Yeah, certainly this is not a sort of unusual occurrence for a young goal kicker to, to be on this, the point that Max is on um, at it in his career now. Goal kicking waxes and wanes. Um, and, you know, pressures that, that, are, that come to bear with that are, are very normal. Max is on a journey to getting mastery of his goal kicking. The most important factor in becoming a master of anything is deliberate practice. Um, so Max needs to invest in that and he knows that and he's working hard on it. Over the course of his career, he's going to have a lot of influences on his goal kicking. He's had a lot already. He gets advice from, you know, punters leaning over the fence at training. He, you know, there's, there's a lot of well-meaning people who want to give Max advice. Obviously, um, you know, Matthew's very well qualified to do that and he has had impact on Max in, in his past as his contact with him at Halebury um, and probably will have in the future. What we were trying to manage at that point in time was just making sure Max didn't have too many voices in his ear at the one time because there were a lot coming in and there still are. So we're just trying to manage that. Next one from Tim Bottrell, who's a five-year member. Given where our season's at now, are we going to make development the key priority for the rest of the year? Well, Tim, um, yeah, our, I suppose you know, the, the part for us will be about to maintain this bridge the gap theme that we're trying to maintain for the rest of the year but it's also the opportunity to look at players um, that are performing well and you know Leo Connolly would be one that we'd like to look at in the future um, and get a game into and that's been you know through a little bit of adversity with our list we've actually got to look at you know Oscar Claverino, Tommy Highmore which was you know a really good performance last week, R Ryan Burns, you know Jack Jack Bytel's played a lot of games this year, even as part of the sub as well, the medical sub. But we've got some exposure to our list, which has been which has been healthy under adversity. It's um, be ideal to have Jones and Marshall and these players there, but um, this will be something that is good for us long term. But I think the bridge the gap is the biggest thing that we'll just keep trying to develop and maintain. It's probably worth explaining a bit about um, Bytel. I reckon we think Jack's going pretty well, but he's got some areas yeah. to work on. I know that. Members and fans and some people I know closely sort of keep asking, why is he not um, necessarily getting full games or games every week? Yeah, um, Jack really is a second year player. Um, I think he's played 10 out of 13 games. Um, but you know what he's shown is in in games that he's you know he's played pretty well for periods, and probably more one half to the second half, and um, that's where his forms dropped away a little bit. Where he's sort of had nine, ten, eleven possessions in a half, and then only three in the second half. And playing midfield, you probably need to have more impact there. Um, he's still learning the game. I think Jack Steele in his second year had uh, sixteen or seventeen games for the season. So I think I think Jack Bytel is on the same path as that, and um, you know he'll learn a lot this year but you know he'll learn the the rigors and the, the you know the physical demands of playing as an inside mid and 
what we've done with Jack as well. We've played him on a few players, um, especially when the games haven't gone our way, to get some exposure on some of the elite players of the competition. And he's done some run with, and you know, it means he might not get the ball as much, but he's learning from these players, which is critical for his development in the future. I think what you've just said there, Rats, confirms this isn't the case, but we've had a member to straight up ask, why have we given up on this season? Did you want to elaborate that we no, haven't? <laughs> we haven't given up on the season. Um, I think the question after uh, the game uh, on the weekend, I said it's going to be harder now um, and with our percentage it makes it tough. But um, until it's finished, we'll be striving for that. Um, you know, Hopefully Rowan Marshall's back uh, against the Tigers on Friday night, which would you know, really give everybody a big boost. But um, yeah, we haven't given up on the season. Um, we just need to keep addressing our consistency, um, not just from week to week, but from quarter to quarter. And we saw that against Adelaide that last quarter wasn't where we want to be. So that's what we'll be striving for. Well, I mean, also, whatever happens for the next 10 weeks, um, it's about building to be better. So there's no, there's a lot to be achieved and gained from the rest of the year, whether that's... Um, on the ladder or if it's in the growth that we're going to ask for from our players, yeah. our coaches, understanding what we need for next year. Um, there's a lot to be gained in the next 10 weeks. A lot to be gained. This is from Warren McLaren, who's a 25-year member. As a playing group, the Saints appear to be playing without confidence or belief. Do we have a sports psychologist on board? And I think you touched on him before, Arthi. Talk about... Dr. Ben Robbins. Yeah, we've got Dr. Ben Robbins um, on our team. And I, I think we're really fortunate to have one of the, the best in the business from the sports psychologists that I've been involved with. Ben is by far the most integrated sports psych um, in an AFL program that I have any knowledge of. Um, he gets uh, a lot of airtime in our program. Uh, he uses that to drive behaviour change uh, in the mental skills space um, with our team. Uh, and when I say mental skills, that's important because they are skills and they take time to develop. So Ben's been in our program, like me, for 18 months. Um, you know, we're trying to improve skills across a range of domains with our players and the mental skills is one of those. It takes hard work and like goal kicking, it takes deliberate practice. Um, so we're working hard to ingrain that philosophy within our players uh, and we'll get benefit from it, I'm sure of it. And yeah, we've got a ripper in Ben there. Question from Clinton Meehan, who's a 17 year member. After last year, was there too much pressure and expectation placed on the team to succeed? And was it unrealistic? Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, embracing the challenge and the expectation is critical to have success and I don't think we'll shy away from it. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that this football club is on an upward path um, and sometimes we're not taking the steps as quickly as we want to, but um, yeah, we won't be shying away from the expectations of trying to play finals every year and, and be in the top echelon of the, the competition. That is critical and um, it's professional sport and we need to keep driving that and um, yeah, we, uh, we, we embrace the challenge but we probably haven't met the challenge this year where we'd like to be um, you know, more up the ladder and uh, further developed in that space. Still a few more to get through. Uh, we have however run out of slides so you just get to listen to my dulcet tones for the rest of the question. Um, a few on recruitment. So recruiting older injured players. Are we getting value? That one's from Nicole Sweeney, who's a two-year member. Uh, I guess that refers to um, probably this year, McKernan and, and Frawley. Um, we haven't got the value from those two we would have liked. Um, but in saying that, the value we were after was certainly to support the depth of our list. Um, I guess for Sean uh, to back up Marshall and Ryder um, and sure enough we, we've had a lot of not having those two out there so he's been required so is Paul Hunter. Um, are they our first two rucks? No they're not um, and Sean has played a few games, been in okay form, been out of form and, and also been injured. Um, uh, Chip Frawley you know, came in and when he came in eventually after a hamstring um, things looked much uh, solider down back when he could take a player like Hawkins and that's why we got Chip uh, not to play every week um, we are really happy with Wilkie and Howard uh, but Chip was there to to provide depth you know if it was that Carlisle wasn't playing and again sure enough Carlisle is out for the season so we need Chip to play he's he's thereabouts test wise with his shoulder um, so those two haven't worked but we weren't we weren't um, looking for those two to take us to the next level um, 
looking for those two to support our playing group and to be available to back up and to play roles when required and they'll still do that in the last half of the year. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been some challenges with that but you certainly need to have uh, depth that you can call upon when you need it and that's certainly the reason we got the two of them. Moving forward, will the club be looking to recruit youth to complement the young to middle-aged profile of our current list? That's from Andrew Greco, who's a 17-year member. I just missed the start of that. Can you go again? Sorry. Moving forward, will the club be looking to recruit youth to complement, I guess, the age bracket that we kind of have at the moment? Yeah, we absolutely. I mean, I think the best part of recruiting is you know, a blend of both. You need you need to have experience. You need to have high end talent in the 26 plus brigade, but you need to have the youth coming through. We've um, we've had some good selections in the last few years in you know Clark Caulfield King. Uh, and Allison last year as first round picks. Uh, we'll certainly have a first round pick again this year. Um, you know, we we at 2018 when most of us started here, um, we had a list that we didn't think was to the level, and we needed to make significant change to it. And um, you know, it was quite a celebrated um, period to bring in you know five players for the 2020 season, uh, four of which I think we're in our top 10 best and fairest in. Uh, Ryder, Butler, Howard, um, and I'm forgetting one other. Jones. Uh, Jones. Yeah. Um, and they made a big difference, and we needed that bracket of player from 23 to 26 to be in there. Uh, we've also added Healy, which has been talked about, and uh, if this club's successful across the next few years, I think Brad will be a big part of that. Um, but, yeah, we need to invest in youth for sure. We need, your your first-round picks are critical. Uh, we intend to use this year's one, um, and we'll build from the bottom with those players, but also keep investing in our in our middle middle age list. We've got, I think, the second least players over the age of 28 on our list. Um, so you can cut and dice your age groups whichever way you like. But um, yeah, we'll keep adding some youth. It's critical. This next one's from Patrick Lawrence, who's a 22 year member, and it's going to give you the opportunity to talk about a guy I know all three of you rate highly. Data analytics is now a common strategy across professional sporting teams in Europe and the US. How are we using analytics? Is it informing our recruiting decision? I'll throw to you, David, on this one. This is your area of expertise. Yep. Um, yeah, we do use uh, data and analytics heavily. We're really fortunate, again, to have a, a very good um, person in our program called Darren O'Shaughnessy. Um, Darren was one of the um, early adopters of, of data analytics in football, worked for Champion Data for a significant period of time. Um, I worked with him previously at Hawthorne where he did a lot of work uh, in game analysis and, and started to work in recruiting as well. Um, Leth has made the smart move to get Darren involved in St Kilda a few years ago. Uh, he works heavily uh, in recruiting, does some really novel work there that I think is giving us an edge over other clubs. Uh, he's a very um, smart guy. I think he's got some unique PhD in uh, astrophysics or something like that. Letters. Yeah, who would know? He's a sharp. He's a sharp man, and he's very important on game day as well with the the live data he feeds to these two in particular on the the key stats that matter for us. And yeah, I'm not sure what the actual question was, but these smarts in your program um, are critical, and I think he's one of the best in the business. And uh, if we can keep building around him, he's got a big role to play in, in all facets of the program. A few questions on individual players. Um, both Luke Colgan and Darren Davies have asked about Josh Battle. Yep. Um, essentially, should he be given a permanent position, a chance to settle, and would that be in the midfield given his strengths? Yeah, um, well, Josh, um, and Josh would be the first to put his hand up in regards to his form. Um, he's... Yeah, he's just lost a little bit of confidence and the last few weeks have shown you know, he's not getting a lot of the footy but against North Melbourne he played as the usual role where he played wing and forward where he got a fair bit of the footy and, and had some shots at goal. So um, we, we've tried him in the midfield um, mainly on the wing. Uh, not so much in the centre square, but he is a big body type of player and, and maybe could play there, but um, his ability his, his, is his running ability for his size and for him to play on the wing where you get space and can use your height, um, it looks ideal. He's a you know, fantastic athlete, but really he's you know stagnated a little bit this year in um, his form and consistency and I think that's mirrored a little bit of the team as well but um, yeah he'll probably just keep progressing through whether he plays wing or forward um, that's where we'd like to play. Next one is on Dan Hanabry. 
what are the club's plans in relation to Dan, considering he hasn't played a game this season and is reportedly taking up considerable amount of salary cap? That's from Adam Weiser, who's a 41-year member. I can, yeah, I can answer that, I guess, on, on part of it. Rats might have a view on other parts, but, look, it's a much asked question and a, probably a much answered question which is fair enough um you know the the two and a half years we've had with dan thus far we haven't got the output that we wanted and expected from dan when we recruited him and and dan won't walk in tomorrow and say what are you saying that for because we discuss it we know it it's true um he's working really hard feel sorry for him that he can't get himself out there you know, he arrived in January this year, won our time trial, did everything right across summer to make sure he came back and, and put that out there for the group, which he wanted to do. Uh, and we haven't got him on the park, you know, in a substantive sense since because he, he's getting himself to the threshold of full training and, and not being able to get through it um, uh, for various issues through his, through his leg and body. Um, so that's a, that's a real uh, disappointment for us. Um, He's working harder than everyone, but it just hasn't worked for us. Um, and, you know, in 2018, we took the, the view that, you know, being aggressive and taking a risk um, was the right thing to do for the attributes that Dan would bring to us. Um, we, we really hope that we see some of it across the next year and a half. Um, but at this stage, it's certainly an uphill battle for him and we're working hard to support him. Yeah, I'd, I'd just touch on that. I think um, we know what he can do on field with, you know, when he's played, he's played really well, especially, you know, towards the back end of last year and, you know, in the final as well. But it's really his leadership around the football club. I think we all, you know, at the club witness his impact on others and, and talks about his experience. But there's no better communicator uh, game day training you can hear his voice from one end of the ground to the other he makes us better as a team um, and he supports his teammates so you know the, the challenge is to get him out there but when we do get him out there whether he gets 8 10 15 20 touches he just makes us a better team because of his leadership out there and his direction for others and that's that's a critical part we we want to get him back out as quickly as possible but he'll add so many things to our on-field performance We've had a few questions roll in about Dan throughout the session, asking whether or not he could pivot towards something like a development coach or I guess more of that coaching side. Is that something, those strengths, you know, you're seeing in him that you think could be in his future? Uh, well, I think he's got attributes to, you know, be in a football program, but um, we sort of see he's still got another year and a half of his contract. So we'd like to keep pursuing him to, you know, get his body right and start to get some continuity in playing the game. So that might be a discussion down the track somewhere that, you know, we have a, a chat with Dan around that um, if we think that's the right one. But right here and now, I think we need to try and get him out in the field. But he even with him not being out on the field, his influence around, you know, Jack by tell. And if you talk to Jack, you know, a couple of years ago, he, Jack was injured and who helped him? Dan Hanabry, you know, just his work ethic and what professionalism was about and things like that. So um, he has an influence whether he's out in the track or not, but we would prefer him out in the track because he has a bigger influence on the group. From one Dan to another, Dan Butler, Ryan Feed wants to know, Dan had an electric 2020 season, but opposition sides have taken notice and reduced his impact in 2021, and his effort has seemed to be a bit inconsistent. Um, how can Dan be held accountable for this role, and what's he working on behind the scenes? Well, I think you witnessed Dan's um, influence on games of football on um, in Cairns against Adelaide, where he had 10... 10 uh, tackles and as a small forward he got shots on goal so he got two shots on goal 10 tackles it's a solid performance for a for a small forward and I think his last month's been pretty consistent but uh, just backing up what David said I think our ball movement hasn't really you know supported a small forward getting to the contest you know deep inside our forward 50 we've had shallow entries um, the ball hasn't been kicked very well inside 50 makes it very unpredictable for a small forward so I think he's playing the percentages the last month and I think his output you know in the last month's been very good um, his pressure's been at the top of its game and if that's the one thing Dan Butler's going to bring he's going to bring pressure and um, for him to have 10 10 tackles last week was brilliant uh, one from James Bird, who's a nine-year member on Dougal Howard. Is Dougal fit? And why is he taking kick-ins instead of Wilkie or Hill? Yeah, Dougal is fit. Um, as, as David has mentioned, um, yeah, we, we, 
believe our players are fit, um, but maybe there's periods in the game where multiple supply from the opposition, you know, and he's got to keep defending and defending and defending, you can look that way. Um, it isn't the plan for Dougal to take all the kick-ins, um, and that's been mentioned a few times that we need to spread that load. So that's something that we're chatting to him about, but we need to make sure that there's a bit of variety with our kick-ins and we change that up a bit. Uh, this is from Ian Randall, who's a 26-year member, a much-talked-about topic this week. For the Seb and Tim paternity leave issue, whatever the difficulties were for their partners has now been greatly magnified. Is the club doing something um, to actively to help their partners through this? And Ian goes on to say he thinks they did the right thing and will continue to be loyal champions for us for many years to come. Uh, we, can, well, we can probably all answer a bit of this. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been much talked about, as you said. I, I like to think that... The connection that we have as a club, especially from last year, we we all spent three months with um, with Marnie and and um, and with them, um, and we're looking forward to welcoming a new member into the world, and and they'll receive the absolute support and blessing and gifts that we always give, and the support that that Tim and Em need, and, and same with Marnie and Seb. Um, I doubt there's been any question about the support from the club, and and I think the players feel that, and the players are in tomorrow, and we'll. We'll rediscuss that with them and the group to make sure they understand it and know it and uh, if they need any further, they'll they'll get it. Um, we probably just talked about the discussion that was had around the fact that they both headed back and, and how we landed there and the problems in between and, and the indecision and, and the ability, our ability to try and get them back, which they both wanted to do as well. So there's a fair bit in all that um, conversation and piece of work, but I don't think there's much in the fact that we support those two and their partners and their families a hundred percent always will and I, I hope they um, they know that and feel that and, I, and the players the boys tell us they do yeah I, I agree with um, letters that's the, you know they were the conversations that we had and yeah probably in my time at the football club but you know there's been history littered with you know family first or the person first um, that's the most critical thing and um, you know Paddy Paddy you know went home for personal reasons and um, we supported that 100 percent and you know Seb, Seb and Tim, they're, they're not easy decisions. They're, you know they're torn apart between their family and, and football, and you know they, they love this footy club and they love their family, and um, they need to make the decision that's best for them and their partner. And you know having gone through personal things myself, um, family is first, and you know if you need to be there, you need to be there, and um, we support that a hundred percent. And um, you know. Yeah, it'd be great to have Seb and, back ne Seb and Tim back next week against the Tigers, but um, we support anything that they want to do from a from a family sense. And me and Seb and Tim have had multiple conversations, even um, with Seb you know, sending me a message before we headed up to Cairns about the disappointment of not getting because of the permit. They wouldn't allow him to come. He was really disappointed and you know, just said, say good day to the boys and send my best wishes. But he wanted to get there and play and um, because of circumstances couldn't. But um, anyone in our program, if there's something that they need to do for their family, that comes first. And one from Glenn McKenna, who's a 29 year member on, I think, I think he's our youngest player. Um, how's Matt Allison going with his development and are we likely to see him debut this year? Yeah, Matt, um, Matt before the COVID restrictions um, probably had his best game, but we played him actually as a backman instead of a forward and end up with about 15 possessions. He's a very good runner, Matt. Uh, he's good size. He's still um, maturing into his body. Um, he's still light framed, but um, yeah, he's going to be a very good size. 195, really moves well and he found a bit of the ball. So he just needs to get some continuity and play VFL. Um, yeah, but you know, there's still 10 weeks to go and who knows you know, with, uh, from there. But um, he, he could play some games, but we're not sure just at the moment. But uh, he needs to just string some consistency at VFL level first and then he'll be in consideration. Now, we've had a few questions come through throughout the session tonight. Uh, this one's for Rathi from Nathan. Rathi, how can we be connected as a group but simultaneously lack effort? Yeah, great question, Nathan. That's the, the one we've been, you know, beating around um, over the last two or three weeks. Um, it, there's no doubt that relationships are the foundation of, of everything we do. When you get a group of people together, the first thing you've got to do is, is be connected. Then you have to understand purpose um, and give absolute effort towards that purpose. So we worked on the connection last year. We, we get along. We're a group of people who are tightly related to each other. That's not the issue here. Um, 
what we're lacking is that connection around or the, the effort around purpose. So that's what we're working on at the moment. So I think that's where the distinction lies there. And another question that's pretty um, integrated with that, we've had someone anonymously come through asking, can you explain what you mean by high performance edge? Yeah, sure. I think it's um, high performance, is, it's a really good question because high performance is a term that's bandied around sport a fair bit. For us, I think it's more, you know, having that, um, I suppose you could use the word ruthless, um, a bit more of a driven edge of, about the way we go about things on field and off field towards achieving our goal of becoming, you know, this idea of a dynasty team. So it's 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 about focus and it's about having um, direction and, and I suppose, yeah, as I say, a bit of ruthlessness about getting there and a hunger. Question has come through from Aaron, um, who rightly points out we do have two probably younger players than Matt Allison who've recently joined us. What plans do you have for our mid-season recruits in Max and Cooper? Yeah, well, Max is uh, still going to play some school footy. Um, we'll allow him to do that for, you know, maybe the next two or three weeks. And then he'll come into our Sandringham program. He's been at the club and uh, been assessed. He's done a bit of work. His favourite player is Rowan Marshall, so they've caught up and had a chat. But he'll really use this year to finish school and, you know, just keep developing his football for us to get an understanding of him. And Cooper Sharman has got probably another week or two back in South Australia and then he'll be over with us and play at Sandy, which will be great. He's, uh, we were a little bit concerned about our numbers in um, Sydney going up to Cairns and he flew up just in case he was needed. Um, it would have been a fair debut to meet your mates for the first time, but um, he wasn't required, which was good. And um, he trained with us. and. You know, he shows that he's a real natural footballer and um, he's still got a bit of work to do with his you know, physique and maybe just uh, some of the running capacity that he's shown, but um, his skill and touch and that he looks like he's um, a nice player. Uh, Julio has asked, player selection has come under pressure at times. How can we be more transparent with members on this process so people can understand the thought process you guys are going through at selection? Um, yeah, it's a good point. Um, it's a good question. It's, um, I suppose the big thing was that, you know, with the teams getting put in the day before made it um, you know, a bit hard to be transparent with it because um, it was only the day before. Um, probably this year's been harder than ever. With, we've had a lot of players under a cloud um, and not, we're not sure if they're going to play. Um, so that's been one of the challenges that players have been getting up late or not getting up. And so we haven't had too many late changes, but it's been very hard to be transparent in that space. So yeah, it's something that we can, we can probably talk about a bit more, but um, this year hasn't been as easy as others. Uh, one from Brad Murphitt, who is a 24-year member, and I'll direct this one to you, Rathi. How much education are the players given of the meaning behind the crest? Because it's so important for our culture. Yeah, I mean, the, the crest game that we refer to refers to the, the game um, where we won a game with 15 players, which is a significant part of our history. And Russell Holmes, our historian, um, has educated our players about the, you know, the significance of that game. The, the crest is an important part of our history. It is part of our speak. Uh, it's the name of our behavioural framework. So it is given significant airtime. It's, it's an important part of our, our program for sure. Yeah, and, we, and just to back that up, we do have a, um, a crest winner each week who's um, you know, rated by the players about their behaviours around the crest. And they've um, last year it was a medal and this year's a, a photo um, which is in the hallway so everyone can see what round and who achieved that. Question through from an anonymous uh, source. Um, how are we planning to rally the troops together this week and, and get up for the Tigers game on... Friday next week. It's a big game, big stage. What's the plan to get the boys together? Uh, we'll meet tomorrow um, and go through our review. Um, there'll probably be some difficult conversations around our performance from, you know, it's been a fair bit of time and everyone's digest a fair bit from that game, but um, we still need to review that and review it strongly. So we'll go through us at our best and us at our worst so we'll address that but really it's for us about sticking to the process and some of the gaps that we do have is around training that and improving in that space and we will start that on you know saturday morning um it will do it during the week and hopefully we start to bridge those gaps but you know 
with somebody like a Marshall coming back, I think that'll be, you know, something exciting for the group. Um, yeah, he's just got to get through a, the Saturday session, and I think he'll be right. But um, yeah, that someone like that will be, you know, a real connector for the group and a bit of a spiritual person around. Um, you know, he's got so many mates, and he sits in that age bracket. And you spoke about somebody that, you know, who could lead this footy club and a leader. He has got leadership qualities, and um, you know, um, to have him back on the field would be great. Now, I swear this next one's not from my burner account. It's from Marcus, who's a two-year member. And he is wanting to know if we can give the Saints media team more access to inner sanctum access to players. Is that something that's on the card, Simon? Well, I think we're – I was just thinking about the match committee question before. We're, we're keen to give our members uh, as much information, as much access as is humanly possible uh, without you know, giving away trade secrets and whatever else might be around. Um, you know, you saw some vision before that was pretty raw about how we're unpicking where we're at and hearing from players on Zoom about what it means to them and how they can improve. So we've, we're not looking to um, squirrel away and, and you were at that meeting yourself, Claire, and gave your views. So, um, no, we're, we're keen to, to be as progressive and open as we can um, as part of the professional environment we've got here. So Inner Sanctum Access is always available for you and the team, Claire. Thanks, Lethers. That's in recording now, so that's we'll hold you to it. And I might just throw it to you guys as well. If you've got any parting words, things you want to reiterate from from you to the members, if there's anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up tonight, uh, I'll go first. If you like, I mean, all I want to say is, um, you know, we've had a pretty, uh, I was going to say, exhausting week, but you know, it's been a pretty uh, tough few days for us after a loss. Um, in Cairns and thanks to the the public of Cairns for welcoming us there for a game that we wanted to play and did our best to execute without being able to be in the community but um, probably just want to reach out to the fans and say we are frustrated, we know you are um, we want to bring joy uh, and happiness to you guys and we want to thank you and, and reward you for your ongoing support as the the biggest increasing membership base and the most loyal membership base last year so we know you're all in um, you know Please have faith that we are all in too and our playing group um, want to be all in and they're learning about what that means and they want to get better. And um, I guess the trajectory we started from 2018-19 um, is not linear and there's there's bumps in the road and this is one of them. Uh, but we intend to, to bounce out of it uh, and make the most of learning from uh, where we're at and we look forward to hopefully bringing joy and uh, reward to, to your loyalty. Yeah, I certainly pick up on and echo Letha's comments. We we definitely share your, your frustrations out there. We're, we're disappointed with where things are at, but we're very optimistic. Um, these dips are normal uh, as you grow as a football club. If you can look at look at the, the history of the football clubs that succeeded over you know the last twenty or thirty years, most of them at some stage have had a dip along their journey. Yeah, this is a um, an early dip. Um, it's a steep dip. It seems a steep dip at the moment, but it is an opportunity for us to get better. And, and we think we have real clarity around that right now. And so perhaps um, without this dip, we don't dig so deep and find out um, the, the answers that we're finding out now. So we think this is going to set us up to move forward really well yeah I'll, um, you probably sp stole my words but um, yeah there's been an enormous amount of frustration when we've been in positions to win games uh, especially the last two weeks and haven't achieved what we want to do but um, as David just mentioned I think um, for us to go through these experiences and maybe if we would have had success we might have just band-aid over some of these cracks but this will allow us to dig a lot deeper and really try and set ourselves up for, you know, to get to where we want to get to and um, and build this strong foundation. And I think, as Simon mentioned, uh, there's a lot of people here working behind the scenes. The, the pleasing aspect it has been is, as the vision showed, the conversations are more confronting, more challenging. Uh, they've been better than they've ever been. And we have to get into that space to become, you know, an accountable football team. And, um, yeah, some of the questions are going to be, you know, challenging for some, but uh, I think actually uh, making everybody accountable and, you know, questioning from the coach right down um, is what we're about and we need to improve. And I think this will help us long term, not just short term, but long term. So thanks for all your support. Um, you know, big challenge against the Tigers, but, you know, that's what we're about. We want to face this head on. 
And that's it. Gents, thank you so much for your time tonight. And everyone at home, thank you for sending through your questions and spending your afternoon with us. This recording will be available to Saints members in the coming days and a condensed version will be available on saints.com.au. So thank you so much for all your questions and for your time and we'll see you at the footy.